Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum uh, and greetings to everyone. Uh, welcome to Mark for our program Conversations with Authors. My name is Shabir Jaffa and I'm one of the directors here. Every month we invite an author or an academic from the Muslim community to join us, talk about their work and answer some questions. If you'd like to know more about what we do at, here at the Mullah Asghar Ali uh, Resource Center and Library, uh, otherwise known as MARC, uh, please visit our website at markresource.com. That's markresource.com. Uh, you can also sign up there to receive news of our future events uh, and access videos of past interviews and uh, with authors and academics. In a moment, I'm gonna introduce you to our author for today's program. I have some questions for him. And after that, I'll turn it over to you, our listeners, so that you can ask him some questions or, or comment on his work. If you'd like to ask a question, I'd ask you to please use the chat function and text your questions to me. Um, or if you want to ask a question orally, uh, please click the little hand icon uh, on Zoom to let me know and, and our AV people will unmute you so that you can ask the question yourself. Um, so now let's meet today's author. Uh, it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce you to Professor Hossein Kamali, who is joining us from Stamford, Connecticut in the USA. Professor Hossein Kamali has held the Imam Ali Chair in Shia studies and dialogue among Islamic schools of thought at the Hartford Seminary since 2019. Before obtaining his PhD and MA, both in history from Columbia University, he had earned an MSc degree in mathematics, statistics, and operations research from New York University. His undergraduate degree was in computer and electrical engineering from Shahid Beheshti University in Iran, Tehran. Um, in Tehran, Iran, sorry. In Tehran, he pursued diverse disciplines of learning, activity, and, and participated in formal classes and informal circles on philosophy, epistemology, and traditional Islamic learning. Between 2000 and 2017, Professor Kamali taught in various capacities at the City University of New York, Columbia University, and Barnard College. He also worked as Middle East Islamic and Jewish Studies Librarian at Columbia University from 2004 to 2007. His first book in English, God and Man in, in Tehran, uh, Contending Visions of the Divine from the Qajars to the Islamic Republic, that's all one title, was published in 2018 by Columbia University Press. His next book, a History of Islam in 21 Women was published in 2019, and that will be the focus of our discussion and our conversation today. He's currently working on several projects, including a monograph entitled Giving Voice to Scripture, Tafsir in the Imani Shia Tradition. So let's begin with and bring our author in now. Professor Kamali, Salam alaikum. And thanks for joining us today. Salam alaikum and greetings, uh, Shabir, to you and to each and every one of participants in this Zoom meeting. Uh, good afternoon. It's a beautiful day here in Stanford, and I hope it is so. Uh, it is also wherever you may be. And I welcome all our listeners to the program too. I look forward to hearing uh, your questions later, your comments. Um, so let's begin. Uh, I must say, Professor, uh, your book. Islam in, in 20, the history of Islam in 21 women is one of the most readable, enjoyable books or engaging books that I've, I've read in this series uh, that I've had of conversations with authors. I learned so much about the achievements of Muslim women um, over the last 1000 years. It's a subject that has not really received the written uh, attention that it merits. Why do you think that is? That's a great starter question. Um, before I answer that question, if I may, I just mm -hmm. want to uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Hasnin Walji, and the Mullah Asghar Ali Library 
for inviting me and giving this opportunity to me to share some ideas about the book with you You're and welcome. your and your audience. Thank you very you much. Are we welcome. are also mindful of the date. We are only three days away from Arba'in. So we are also very mindful of that date. And um, uh, uh, we remember that somber day on our religious calendar. Um, thank you for the point that you made. And uh, the question about why aren't, why haven't Muslim women received enough attention in Muslim historiography and in, or in world historiography. Um, it has been the case with um, Western historians of Islam to sideline women. And we have come across some pretty mean and methodologically false claims made about Muslim women. Uh, and that is what we don't expect because women's studies has been a serious topic in uh, Western universities for a long time. And we would expect um, major scholars to, to think about restoring the voice of women in Islamic history. Now, there, there have been important attempts um, about the study of uh, women in various periods in Muslim history, but a thorough a rewriting of the history of Islam around the women has not been or hadn't been attempted. And I hope that my little book uh, may open the way, may be the first but not the last of many books that restore the presence of women in Islamic history. Um, yes, let, let us leave it at that if, if mm -hmm. this answers your important question. And there is a lot more to say that uh, you know, about history that is usually his story, mm. the history of men, the history mm -hmm. of kings, the history of caliphs, the history of uh, warriors, the history of men of learning. And then women are pushed to the sidelines as at best doing domestic work, yes. as if domestic work doesn't count. Whereas even domestic work is the bedrock of, of economy, of human economy at any moment in history. Right. right. So I tried to draw attention to that and this uh, rather simple and I hope accessible and informative um, monograph. Yeah. I, am, uh, I am tickled by the use of that pun, his story, uh, because it's so true as you, as you apply it in that context. Uh, but anyway, we now have a book to, uh, uh, to appreciate. Uh, and I, as I said, I, I've read the entire I've read the entire book and, and enjoyed it. From the start, you have um, uh, the, the, the beginning, you have a, a forward and, and, then a, and then a beginning chapter devoted to, uh, of course, the uh, Lady Khadija, um, the wife of the Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him. Um, and so we are, uh, we'll start with that, that chapter first. Um, in that chapter, you state, uh, that it is important to highlight that the first ever person to receive the Holy Prophet's message was a woman. Um, is that because many scholars tell us that it was either uh, Ali ibn Abu Talib or Abu Bakr? Um, they were, or he, he was the first man to receive it, but not the first person to receive the message of Islam. Uh, what are your thoughts there? Um, well, the question of who was the first and what was the succession of people who accepted the prophet's um, message is a big question in Islamic hist historiography. It is of major importance. Who was yeah. the first and who were the earliest ones? Uh, there is this um, verse in the Quran in uh, Surah Al-Waqi'ah that refers to the first comers the pioneers, as sabiqun as sabiqun, and this this concept of sabiqa, the precedence, became very significant in the early history of Islam. To say, okay, who was the first? It certainly played a role in um, subsequent uh, explanations of uh, succession to the Prophet. Mm -hmm. But the sources are very clear that the first person to accept the Prophet's message. message was uh, Lady Khadija. That is very clear. You find it in, in uh, Ibn Hisham's rendition and recension of Ibn Ishaq's biography, which is a very early biography 
certainly not the first and not the only biography, but one of the earliest ones. Yeah. And I emphasize that because some Orientalists have mistakenly um, claimed that Ibn Ishaq was the, um, is the oldest um, sira or biography of the Prophet. Anyway, uh, they are all very clear and unanimous that the first person was Khadija. And then the second person is Ali ibn Abi Talib. And the third person is um, uh, Zayd ibn Harissa, who was the Prophet's servant. And the fourth person uh, is Abu Bakr. But the idea was that the first free adult male was Abu Bakr uh, mm -hmm. uh, ibn Abi Qahafa. Qahafa, um, may God be pleased with uh, him and, go, and, and the Prophet's companions. Uh, but this precedence is of uh, extreme importance. And I think we need to highlight and emphasize that the first person mm -hmm. who accepted the message and the way she accepted and endorsed the message and supported the prophet yes. was, was crucial in the development of Islam. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, staying with her chapter, um, you write that uh, Lady Khadija was Prophet Muhammad's shield and a force to be reckoned with in Makkah. Tell us more about that and why you think, as you wrote, that the cause of Islam might have been different had she lived longer. Well, I think we have all heard or read of Lady Khadija's important role in financial support of the Prophet's mission. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows. But I think that is that falls short of explaining her even more substantial and substantive contribution in terms of the emotional support that she provided uh, for the prophet. She was the rock of his life, I would say. So when he came back from that momentous experience in Mount Hira and went to his wife, Khadija, his wise, um, companion in life mm -hmm. and said to her what had happened. She did not discourage her. She didn't say, okay, sleep on it. Mm. She said, yes, you are a truthful man and God only speaks the truth to truthful people and you are a truthful person. And throughout her life, she capitalized not only on her wealth, but also on her social stature as a major member of uh, the ruling tribes in Mecca on both sides of her parents, mm. uh, a woman of means and a woman to be reckoned with to support her husband. All right. And it was, it is extremely important to note that when she passed away uh, in the same year that the prophet's other protector passed away, Abu Talib, uh, the prophet mourned that year by calling it the year of grief, yes. the year of chagrin right? Aum al in the yeah. Prophet's history. And that's extremely important. And the Prophet was extremely loyal to Khadija on many, many ways, many levels. Uh, and I think we need to, to raise this in our consciousness and in mm -hmm. world consciousness about Islamic history, that a woman is very much at the center, right. at, at the origin of the religion. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, indeed. It, it, it's interesting to speculate just how Islam might have been different had she lived longer. Um, anyway, um, moving on to chapter two, which is about, of course, uh, none other than the Lady of Light, Fatima Zahra, alayhi salam. Um, you wrote uh, of, I quote, the prophet's preference that men should take, should not take more than one wife. Um, this was during a time when polygamy was common. Uh, was a common practice, uh, and the Prophet himself had multiple wives, many of them for the purpose of political alliances. Uh, mm -hmm. Why do you think it is that Imam Ali, alayhi salam, did not take another wife while he was married to Fatima, alayhi salam? I think um, that is a very clear sign of respect for uh, Fatima Tazahra, salam alayhi and at some point, some chroniclers tell us that he may have intimated um, the desire to bring another woman into the household. Yeah. 
and uh, Lady Fatima complained to her father, the Prophet, mm -hmm. and the Prophet convinced Imam Ali not to, mm -hmm. not to do that, and he respected that. And and I think as the Quran itself is very clear about polygamy, that says if you cannot be just mm. and you cannot be just and you cannot be just suffice with one right so the emphasis is there yes again in retelling this history um i am trying to not just report on what happened but on what seems to have been the ethos yes right mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you go on to describe Fatima as a strong-willed and mm -hmm. able-bodied woman who bore five children and ran a busy household. Right. Um, in the book, After the Prophet by Leslie Hazelton, an excellent book, um, Fatima is described as sickly and that she died young. Do you see a little bit of a contradiction here? Well, it is true that uh, Lady Fatima died young. Um, depending on how we calculate um, her lifespan. Mm. She, was, she was very young and she passed away uh, shortly after the pro prophet's demise. Yes. Uh, sometime between a few months, um, a few weeks or a few, a couple of months, a few months. However, the notion that has been um, hammered in some chronicles about Fatima being sickly, I think is historically weak and incorrect. Um, she bore um, four children. That is uh, a sign of bodily uh, strength mm. and health, right? And she was hardworking. We have accounts of her working at the home, uh, the home that she built with her husband but the idea that she was sick, sickly, is kind of a trope that is sometimes used by historians to um, overshadow the voice of women. Mm -hmm. Oh, they are sick, they are weak, but no. She is a woman who stood up and spoke truth to power in her time. Yes. And uh, demanded that her father's um, will be exercised. Right. So I'm trying also to challenge or to question yes. this, this expression um, or this reading of history that she was kind of um, sickly and weak. Okay, okay. I, I'm going to refer now to chapter three, uh, which was about uh, Aisha bint Abu Bakr, peace be upon right. her. Um, you wrote that, I quote, when the prophet took his last breath in her chamber in 632, right. many accepted her testimony that the prophet had wished right. her father to lead the community as his successor or khalif. Right. And I quote again, that chroniclers all agree on the significance of Aisha's intervention on the matter of the prophet's successor and that the mm -hmm. impact of her intervention in the history of Islam remains uncontested. Now, that contrasts sharply, I'd say, with the Shia perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, can you elaborate on that, please? It does contrast sharply with the Shia view, as you say. Uh, and that contrast highlights the significant contribution or influence of um, <clears throat> Aisha bint Abi Bakr. Uh, may God be pleased with um, her. And, um, in justifying the choice made at the Saqifa, mm -hmm. in justifying that and making room for that. Now, this book is about the role played by women in Islamic history um, or the presence of women in Islamic history. Um, it doesn't mean it is not an endorsement of whatever may have happened, yes. right? But it is a it is a report in some cases, and in some cases, I also add, bring in my own voice to make a judgment. But this is clearly um, a matter of extreme importance. Yes, and the Prophet had also reportedly, as we understand, had said, 
go and ask for two thirds of your religion or half of your religion or a big part of your, what your religion, what your conduct should be, go find out from Aisha. Aisha was a very powerful voice in, in Islamic history, mm -hmm. right? Her contestation with some of the companions over issues related to women is very clearly noted. Her opposition to uh, the early Umayyad Caliph is very clearly um, documented. And also because of that, retrospectively, the voice of Aisha was kind of silenced in later historiography. So we know that many chains of transmission that went back to Aisha were re replaced in some works yes. by male reporters. That's another uh, scholar scholarly achievement and a scholarly finding that we yes. have in the 20th century, mostly. Yes. And thank you, by the way, for reminding all of us, our listeners and myself, of um, our conversation here as being based on academic freedom and academic debate and, and not necessarily um, trying to, to, to uh, show one side over the other. Sure, and that is sure. the true spirit of this conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Um, turning to the chapter on Rabia al-Adawiyah, mm -hmm. the celebrated female Sufi, uh, you state that her life and legend represent the evolution of an inward looking and spiritual articulation of Islam. Give us some context about that development, the, the development of that type of Islam. Right. Um, Rabia al adawiyas life um, evolved during the time that we know sometimes historians recall as the Abbasid revolution. That is from around the uh, mid eighth century of the common era yes. to the latter part of the 8th century. Um, some chroniclers have mistakenly put her um, in time of, in earlier times, uh, around 720s. That does not seem to be accurate. And there is an important book that was published also two years ago on Rabia and has a revision of that uh, and the correction to that early historiography. So she lived during this time of turmoil yeah. Um, that we know as the Abbasid revolution, but it was not just the Abbasids or the Hashemids. There are many, many revolutionary um, developments occurring. And there was a lot of um, reaction against what had become, or what seemed to have become of the true mm -hmm. message of the prophet. Right. It had become about uh, kingship, power, exercising authority, confiscation of lands. And there is definitely an inward um, looking moment as exemplified by the early Sufis. Um, mm -hmm. Notable among them is Rabia as a female voice. Yes. We know from uh, early sources, for example, from Kitab al-Aghani, that in the second century of Islam, that is the eighth century, women used to preach at the mosque. And, Ab and Rabia is one of them. Mm. Actually, the person of Rabia is not one person, but many person telescoped into one. Yes. Women would give speeches at the mosque and men would, would go, uh, would wonder at the depth of the women, women preachers um, teachings. Mm. Now, and, and Rabia is one of those voices, but, but she is also a contemporary of Ibrahim ibn Adham, right? yes. who was a, the son of a ruler, a prince from Khorasan, and is known as one of the earliest Sufis who left. And his life story bears uh, some resemblance to the story of the Buddha and how he gave up his princedom and went and became um, a mystic. Now, instead of focusing on his story, Yes, I have focused on Rabia's history as an yeah. exemplary uh, early Sufi. Right. Okay. okay. Um, I I'll want you to tackle one question here, which doesn't relate specifically to one of the women, but it's a general statement um, mm -hmm. where you say, uh, in in re reference to the circulation of inauthentic hadith, mm -hmm. uh, local stories took on new lives, sometimes mm -hmm. disguised as hadith. Mm -hmm. Popular preachers attributed the words 
to the prophet mm -hmm. that he had not uttered. Mm -hmm. um, so very, very briefly, does this happen still today? And what has been and to what degree has this had an effect on the Ummah? Oh, that's an important question. That's a deep uh, delving question. Speaking falsely in the name of the prophet is unfortunately um, still common. Yeah. Um, however, in a different context, um, especially going against what one might say was the prime ethos of the prophet. Yeah. Uh, so there is so much formalism these days. Uh, right. Okay, this is what he said and this is what he meant. However, in the 8th century, as of yet, the transmission of hadith was not uh, uh, canonized. Mm -hmm. um, various voices were present and it took at least another century, at least another century, maybe longer, for the methodology to, to congeal and to take shape of the assessment of hadith, what hadith could be true, could not be true. And there is a lot of um, uh, scholarly debate continuing to this day about the shaping of the hadith in right. the early centuries, right? right? Uh, but at least from the uh, ninth century of the common era, that is the third century, we have attempts at um, solidifying not only the text of the hadith, but also the chains of transmission of hadith. Okay. Right? And that becomes, uh, early on, we have the works of some um, students of Ahmad ibn Hanbal and, and Ahmad ibn Hanbal himself. And later we have the works of hadith compiled by uh, 12 Shia scholars, um, such as Kolini and uh, Sheikh Sadduq, and eventually two uh, important works by Sheikh Tusi. And there are others, I'm just giving examples. Okay, thank you. Um, in the chapter on Queen Arwa of mm -hmm. Yemen, right. this reveals a woman who held not only religious authority, but also political power over a very vast domain. That's right. a unique combination for a woman to have had in the 11th century, isn't it? Right. That's a very uncommon phenomenon. And at the same time, extremely important because this was not a short-lived reign. Hers was not a short time or a short-term uh, stint. Yes. She had power for 50 years. She exercised mm -hmm. power. She remained in power for half a century. So this goes very much against the voice of uh, those who want to say that women in Islam were always, um, they didn't have any contribution, they didn't have any voice. And most scandalously, what we have read in the work of a scandalous, um, um, in a scandalous work, yeah. that the only obverse to Muslim gravitas is the giggling of their women folk. Mm. You see how distasteful and how um, resentful this statement is. Yes. And not only is it resentful, it is totally wrong. Yeah. Right? If it were only the giggling of the women folk, you wouldn't have examples of women rulers, right. especially of women, especially a person such as Arwa, who yeah. uh, was an Ismaili Shia woman, um, an ally of the Fatimid um, Caliphate in Egypt, and Arwa ruled Yemen, the south part of the Arabian Peninsula. And from there, he extended her reach well into India and parts of the Persian Gulf Basin today, Gosh. Uh -huh. right? And for 50 mm. years, mm. 50 years, and just to lighten up the spirit, I understand I'm a little bit <laughs> um, uh, maybe boring in my presentation, but uh, there is this story about Arwa's daughter who went to her and complained that her husband, who was a military man, wanted to um, remarry and yeah. have a second wife. Um, and what Arwa did, she made him an offer he could not refuse. <laughs> he sent the army to her house, <laughs> to his house, and convinced him not to take a second wife. Right. But, so, yes, she, so, she had that kind of power. So, Marlon Brando's The Godfather wasn't the first one to come up with that uh, way of uh, getting, getting one's that way. Is the way. That no. is the way to, to, yeah. <laughs> to get things um, done. Good. Good. Um, okay, moving on to a part of the world that, that I guess my origins are from. 
Uh, the Mughal Empress, Noor Jahan, came from a Shia family, grew up in Emperor Akbar's Sunni-dominated court, uh, where she later became one of J Emperor Jahangir's wives. For a woman in those days, again, she amassed a lot of power and influence. How was she able to do that? Uh, well, there is a combination of personal uh, traits and characteristics. Her unbreakability, I think yeah. I, I describe her as uh, being unbreakable. So yeah. much calamity had happened to her, you know, when on the way to India, when they were escaping um, <clears throat> present day Afghanistan, that is Herat, uh, yeah. her family, her parents, her, her father and her side, um, paternal side, uh, seem to have been supported by and supporters of the Safavids. Uh, and then when they were on their way to India, where many people went from the Safavid court in search of uh, position and wealth. Yeah. When she was born, she was left to die on the road. Hmm. Even from the very beginning, she seems to have been unwanted, but then she lived. Hmm. When she was married off to a military commander, a man of valor, her husband, uh, was hacked to death. Mm -hmm. was, her brother met a similar um, fate. Still, she persisted. And as she entered the court as a concubine, she uh, came to the attention of the mother of the ruler. Yes. And little by little, she raised in the ranks and became a favorite of the, of the Sultan of uh, Jahangir. And in a very important sense, as described in the sources, she was the force behind the, behind the throne. Okay. The British envoy to Mughal court writes very negatively about her. Mm. And he says, how could a woman have so much power? Mm. <laughs> but she did, right? And she basically ran uh, or was influential in the running of one of the most prosperous and powerful and culturally significant states in world history. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. I, I, it's now 12.30. I do want to get on to our listeners' questions. They're, they're starting to come in. Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask you to be uh, uh, join me in being concise uh, going forward so we can fit them in. Um, the chapter on Tahra, uh, right. Tahra, who was from a Shia ulama family, was mm -hmm. also very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that her parents came from opposite sides of the right. Suli Akbari divide uh, must have shaped her development and her eventual identity as a Babi. Uh, would you agree with that? Certainly. More inclined toward the uh, Akbari Sheikhi side, more like a follower of Sheikh Ahmad. Al Asai, right? Okay. Yes, definitely. And then um, in chapter 15, we move to the African continent where you write about the West African teacher and healer called mm -hmm. Nana Asmal. Mm -hmm. She lived in the 19th century. She committed herself to improving the lives of women in the right. Sokoto Caliphate. Uh, she worked to eliminate the degrading views and practices against women. Uh, why do you think that inspiring and accomplished women like her mm -hmm. uh, and the Tata Sharia judge, Mukhlisa Bubi, are not very familiar to most Muslims? Well, they should be. Mm -hmm. Their works are available. Um, I mean, the work of Nana Asmo is mo mostly available in English now. Yes. And apparently she wrote in three different languages. She was at least two. She wrote in Arabic and she wrote in um, the local uh, language in, in um, Nigeria, and she yes. knew several other vernaculars, local languages, um, and her work has been translated thanks to, to American uh, scholars uh, yes. into English. And Mukhlis Abubi, also on her, we have now a couple of uh, important papers, and they have, I have used them in the, in the writing of the book, and, and they deserve more attention, and certainly she, Mukhlis Abubi, as well as Nana Asma'u, deserve to be restored in the consciousness of Muslims. For example, in Nigeria, and that is more generally in West Africa, 
more than 100 years ago, we are talking about the 1860s, right? Yeah. Almost 200 years ago, women received an education. Now, in the 21st century, we are faced with groups that say, no, women do not need to have an yeah. education. Yeah. Right? How they ironic used, is that? Right? And they used to sing what they learned. Yes. It's not what, what they used to sing, what Mukhlis, what Nana Asma'u taught them. They would sing it going back home, coming back, and that's how they learned. And, and this is more than a hundred years ago. Yeah. yeah. Right? And Mukhlis Wubi was already a judge back in the 1920s, a woman Muslim, a Muslim woman judge. Yes. Who ruled in accordance with the teachings of the Sharia in Russia right. and in the Soviet, in the so-called Soviet, Soviet Union at the time, 1920s. Right? But eventually she fell prey to Stalin's. Uh, violent uh, purges. Now, we know what, what Stalin did to some other uh, groups, intellectuals, uh, and, and what, she, what he did with churches in, in, in Soviet lands. We hear less about what he did to yeah. Muslims because partly his position changed and his position was um, um, in flux. Mm. However, uh, Mukhlis Abubi is an example of those Muslims who were decimated in those purges. Yes. Right? And we have that. Her family suffered a lot. But very important, uh, the notion of, of uh, the understanding of Islam that developed in Tsarist Russia yes. and then under communist rule is very relevant in our times as well. Right. You, you wonder that there was any religion or faith left in Russia after Stalin finished right. his work. But well, anyway, we, we... But Stalin changed his position yeah. later on. And he used, yeah. um, he used in, in, during the Cold War, um, during the Cold War, um, he saw in Muslims, both in the Soviet Union and outside, a potential ally yes. against the West. And wow. we know that some people have actually um, followed that path. Anyway, but that's a different story, right? Right. It's right. not Mukhlisa's story. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to my last question, and then I'm going to bring uh, bring up a couple of our uh, our listeners who have, who have both emailed questions in advance. Thank yeah. you for that, as well as a couple that have come up on on the page just now. Um, so I'll just move to that. Um, the last two chapters are about two brilliant and accomplished women who lived in the current century. Um, firstly, the talented architect, Zaha Hadid, mm -hmm. and secondly, the so-called princess of mathematics, mm -hmm. uh, Mariam Mirzakhan. Mm -hmm. I particularly liked the description of Mariam, which was, quote, she refused to go for low hanging fruit and her advice, was know what you want and don't get distracted. Mm -hmm. These were women who were clearly not prepared to be sidelined and take second place uh, as their predecessors had been. Uh, we are now faced with a world where in some parts, as you referred to earlier, um, Muslim women uh, are empowered, free to pursue their professional dreams right. and make an impact. And another world where they are being suppressed and marginalized like in Afghanistan. Right. It's a real dichotomy, would you agree? It's a sad dichotomy. And uh, to give a short answer uh, to an important question, the future of Islam to a very large extent depends on the future of Muslim women and the recognition of women in Islam in general by Muslims, yeah. men and women, about the role of women. Uh, in, in the book, I make a somewhat um, self-obvious comment that women's history is human history. Okay. It needs to be um, emphasized right. that the future of this uh, cultural, religious uh, phenomenon yes. depends on the way the voice of women is restored, the way women are empowered. Yes. And this empowerment does not mean uh, or is not restricted to allowing women to, to 
um, to be rebellious or to be naughty. This is not what this book is about. And there is a theoretical framework for it that I have explained it at the end of the book. Yeah. And that whole view of rescuing Muslim women is wrong headed. Right? It's not about rescuing. It is empowerment is important. And more than anything, this has to come from within the Muslim community worldwide. Yes, indeed it does. Well spoken. Um, Professor, I'm going to move now to our listeners' questions. Thank you. Um, these were emailed to me a couple of days ago from Kurban Manji. Uh, the first one is, uh, why 21 women? Anything particular about the 21? He's referring to the, the 21 chapters in your book, each devoted to a, a, a single woman. Um, and if you like, I can combine the question with the second one, which is relevant, is these 21 women were not the only high achieving Muslim women in history. What was your criteria for picking on these particular women? So the first question is why 21, anything special? And then Thank what you was it the about question. these 21 that, that, that made you pick? Thank you for the question. The number 21 refers to the 21st century yeah. and to the publisher's series. Um, the publisher had already published a book called A History of Britain in 21 Women, mm -hmm. and then A History of the World in 21 Women. And when I was visiting London um, before the publication of this book, before writing this book, um, I was visiting my, uh, the publisher and having a very good conversation about uh, women in history, um, very learned couple who run the uh, public uh, publishing house, One World Publications in England. Yes. Uh, at Oxford in London. And then the publisher asked me if I knew anyone um, in the US who would be interested in writing a history of the United States in 21 women. And I, th I said, yes, I can, I can refer you to a few scholars in the field mm -hmm. who are well known and who write um, clearly and without jargon, but at the same time uh, in an informed manner. And right. then I raised another question and I said, and I asked whether he and she, my publisher friends, would be interested in publishing a book on the history of Islam in 21 women. Mm. And now Islam is not a geographic category, unlike, uh, you know, Britain or the United or States. USA, right? Right. Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And he immediately, uh, the uh, person who's in charge of nonfiction uh, publications for One World Publishers said yeah. yes. And immediately sent me, kindly sent me a contract mm -hmm. uh, to write a book about uh, a history of Islam and 21 women. Now, yeah. making the choice was difficult. Um, I want to say, while I appreciate the question very much and similar questions, this is not about famous women or high achieving women or good women. You know, this mm -hmm. is not about that. It's not yeah. my judge, it's not my place to judge or a pious woman, that's not my yes. position to, to, you know, to commit myself to. Yeah. I imagined Islamic history, and this is a topic that I teach, right? Yes. I teach regularly. Um, the rise of Islam, the caliphate, the successions, the revolutions, yes. um, the consolidation, and then the Mongols come, and then uh, the early modern period, and then the modern period. So very common. I know the periodization very well. Yes. And I thought, let me take this periodization, work with that periodization. And instead of writing about kings and caliphs and the ulama and the Sufis in general, mm. let, me, let me retell this story around some women, mm -hmm. around 21 women. Now the publisher tells me 21, and yeah. I'm confined by that number. I'm limited by that number. Yes. And I tell the story around 21 women. Now, if I had a choice, I would include more than 21 women and it would be a richer story. Right. However, as I'm trying to, to say very honestly and sincerely and earnestly, this, let it be the first book mm. that restores the voice of women in Islam, not the last one. Yeah, let yeah. there be many other books about mm. other women, other stories, other narratives yeah. in, in, in the formation of the history of Islam. Now, I have one woman from, um, as you said, I have to keep it concise, but I have one woman who was taken, who was captured, 
near the borders of China mm -hmm. and died in Kerman in Iran. Mm. And she too was influential in politics for a few decades, several decades. Yeah. She worked with the Mongols against some other Mongols and there is still a, a school in her name in the city of Kerman in Iran. Mm. Now, the status of Muslims in China is of extreme relevance in our time. Mm. I recently read a book called Made in China. I recommend that. Mm -hmm. We are not hearing the voice of Muslims in China, men and women, right? Yes. Yes, right. So Maybe. let us, uh, so the answer I gave to 21, and certainly there are many other women, noteworthy women, of course. If I had, a, if I could, and I was limited by the sources here, I would very much weave in, into this book, into this narrative, the lives of ordinary women. Yes. If I had information about a, um, a washerwoman, mm. I would have included it. Right. The problem with historiography is that historiography is interested in famous people, in notorious people, in people who make a name for themselves, right? right. Okay. Well, bravo for your academic uh, research and endeavor in, in writing this book. Um, Thank you. Okay, um, just moving on with Kurban's questions. Um, Sunni-Shia conflict has marred many eras in Islamic history, and some highly influential women were partisans. How did you deal with that, where one party uh, may consider a woman, a particular woman, a heroine, while the opposite party consider her a villain? Right. This is very difficult to, mm -hmm. um, to, to address if one is trying to write from one's, um, let's say, um, political position or sectarian yes. position or ideological position. Yes. But we do, as historians, we are trained to tell other people's stories. Right. And not to be judgmental about, oh, this is a heretic. This is not a good woman. Uh, uh, this is not a good person. Why do you write about people who are not good? But good and bad yes. are not uh, judgments in this book. Right. As you see, there is no trace of such, such commentary in this book. Right? I try to report while staying distant. Yeah. For example, in the mother of the uh, Ottoman king, I talk about her, I talk about her playfulness, her um, correspondence with, with Queen Elizabeth of England. She's yes. very important. She likes to take rides in the chariot that, <laughs> and that, that Queen yes. Elizabeth has sent her. But at the same time, I remind the reader that she killed one of her grandchildren. Mm. She had her killed, not to be uh, an impediment yes. in the path of future successions. Right. right. So this is not a book. This is not a celebration of achievement. Right? Mm. Mm -hmm. Because in our time, we are faced with this kind of celebrity, the cult of celebrities, the greatest, the best. Yes. So this is not about that. Even though I have included women who have been of consequence in this history yes. Yes. but it's not my job to take position and say who is a real muslim who was not a real muslim that's not my job yeah yeah the the next question was something i was tempted to ask you but i figured that somebody in our in our listener group and our subscriber group would would inevitably ask you this right. so i'm gonna again attribute it to uh, uh, the person who sent it uh Kurban. shias consider zainab binte ali ibn abu talib a very important person in spreading Imam Hussein's message. In fact, some believe that Shias would not exist were it not for her. How do you consider her achievements? Well, the question made it easy for me to say, how do I consider her achievements? Yeah. She is a woman of extreme importance in the history of Islam. And of course, in my worldview, my view of history, she is for me, and people who come from a similar background as I do, as Sayyida Zainab, as Lady Zainab, not yeah. just Zainab. Um, so this is a simple, easy question. But the yeah. more difficult question would be, why isn't the chapter 
Why right. isn't there a chapter on say the Zainab in the book? Right. I could give one easy answer. And the easy answer would be, I was limited by the choice of 21. Yeah. And I had to make a difficult decision. But I will confess that now, two years after the publication of the book, three years after finishing the book, that my biggest regret is not having a chapter on Zainab, mm -hmm. say that no Zainab in the book. However, I have thought about this. And I hope to write more than just 3,000 words on Sayyid Azina. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking to write a monograph, an independent monograph yes. on Sayyid Azina, God winning. Right. And there I will be in a position to describe and to flesh out the role, the extremely important role that Sayyid Azina, Ali ibn Abi Talib's daughter, has played. Yes. Hussein ibn Ali's sister. Right. And Zainab as a person herself yeah. Yeah. has played in the history of Islam. And what has been done to her yes. by voices, by powers that have tried to, su to suppress her word. So I let me share this news that I look forward to writing a, an independent monograph on her, maybe a short monograph. We look forward to reading it. Thank you. Okay. Maybe you will invite me and then we'll talk about it. In my, in inshallah, my inshallah. Why not? Um, uh, last one from Kurban, then there are some from on the chat. Another question that popped up is uh, about your book, Tafsir in, in Shia Islam, the one I refer to in your bio. Right. Um, can you tell us more about your forthcoming book? How does Tafsir differ between the two main schools of Madhab? What are the main ayats under contention? Um, it would be wonderful if you can give us a, a, a brief preview of this book. Right. Again, I have to say this, that for the time being, I am not working on that project. Okay. I'm working on other projects. However, it is a shame that we still don't have an independent monograph in English that talks about the uh, more than thousand year old legacy of specific tafsir writing in the Shia tradition. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying 1400, I'm saying 1,000, just to avoid controversy. Uh, one book has published, has been published, has appeared by Brill about 20 years ago. Yes. It's about early Shia tafsir. And the problem with those early, uh, with focusing on that early part is emphasizing the difference between the Shia and the non-Shia, and specifically by pointing out um, by insisting that there was something um, in the Shia tradition that rejected the text of the Quran. Right. This is a very flawed and inaccurate position to take. Mm. I'm trying to use my words, to, to use my words carefully. The, for the most part, the Shia tafsir tradition, that is especially after the occultation, after the fourth century of the common era, as exemplified in the canonical and the pioneering work, uh, Kitab al-Tibyan by uh, Sheikh Tusi, uh, who that was completed in the 11th century, early 11th century, mid 11th century. Um, and then we have had several others. Shia tafsir is an integral part of tafsir in the Islamic tradition. Um, we cannot understand tafsir in the Islamic tradition without taking account, taking account of the most scholarly work on tafsir in the 20th century, which is tafsir al-Mizan by the late Allah Taba mm -hmm. And this is not a sectarian tafsir. This no. is a major accomplishment in Islamic uh, scholarship. Yes. So uh, my view was to to give a more integrative view. And I still want to do that. Yes. And in whatever I do, I try to be, um, to present things from, from an integrative point of view and not a sectarian point of view. This is one reason uh, I use to justify the choices I made in this book, right? Right. right. Choice of 21. Okay. This All answer right. 
got a little bit long. I apologize, but I nope. see that we have questions in, in chat as well. Yes, yes. So I'm going to move to those now. Um, the first question that came through is probably more appropriate for the very end, because uh, it asks about your overall approach or purpose in writing. Um, so I'm going to work on the specific uh, ones and then get to that one. Um, sure. Uh, could Professor Kamali talk current project, uh, giving voice to scripture? Well, we've already done that. Um, then the next one is women have been brainwashed. This is from uh, an unknown, uh, whether well, there's no name attached, it's his iPad or her iPad. Women have been brainwashed that even their voice should not be heard. Um, so in Toronto, we have programs where we are told strictly for women. How can that ideology be changed? And is it haram for a woman to recite Quran or a poem or a marcia where there is a male audience? Um, your call if you want to take that, that question. I know it's not necessarily your area of uh, expertise, but I'll, I'll let you go at it if you'd like to. <clears throat> I will try, but I'll try to be circumspect as well. Mm. Um, when I teach, you know, I'm a teacher. I go to class and I teach. And one of the courses that I teach is contemporary Islamic ethics. What I make clear to the students in the class is that the emphasis in this class is on contemporary and ethics. Um, so I, I tell them, I tell my students that this is not a book only about 10th century, 11th century, 13th century books on ethics. It's about contemporary ethics. So we need yes. to talk about medical ethics. We need to talk about environmental ethics. Yes. We need to talk about human rights. We need to, uh, similar questions. Right. And that this is a class on ethics and it's not on Islamic law. It's yes. not on the Sharia. I tell them. And the reason I emphasize that, and I'm very explicit about that, is that they are not prepared. Mm. They are not trained to take a class in Islamic law. Islamic law is a serious field of research. Yeah. of scholarship. So people who have no training in that shouldn't talk about it just as they are not a uh, judicial uh, procedure in, let's say, in Canada or in US uh, yeah. courts or in British courts, anywhere. It's, a, it's, a, it's an expertise, right? It's a, it's a kind of expertise. People who don't have it are not in a position to discuss it. Yeah. And certainly my students so far uh, in the institutions where I've taught are not experts in that field. Right. I am not going to comment on the legal position on mm. the voice of women. Right. But from an ethical perspective, I would say it is unethical to silence women. Mm. It is unethical uh, and unethical and legal are different categories. They sometimes convert, sometimes don't. Mm -hmm. and, and about the second question, whether it is haram or not, Again, I will not judge on the haram and because that I leave it for other people who feel yes. uh, compelled to talk about those things. However, I will tell you that the daughter of Imam Hussein, right? Mm -hmm. Sakina bin Hussein or Sakina bin Hussein, and we have her name in the sources. She had a very difficult life in Medina, right? Mm -hmm. They put a lot of pressure on her they, I mean, the rulers. Um, however, she would invite poets of the time, some yes. of whom did not have a good reputation socially, to come and to recite poetry. And she told them, she instructed them to recite a verse that she had composed about her father, mm. about her protectors. And I remember that every time it's, uh, of course. Um, so she instructed the singers of the time to sing the verse that she had composed. Uh, the voice of women in Islamic history has not been as irrelevant as two groups of people mainly have tried to make it. One of them are the Orientalists Mm. I told you the Orientalists tell us that all the women contributed was giggling, yeah. which is false, which is misogynistic, 
which is it borders on the racist. It's definitely and, and misogynistic. insulting and, and insulting. insulting. Definitely yeah. misogynistic. Definitely uh, misogynistic. Yeah, and wrong. Yeah. Um, but also, some of the ulama mm. have been in unison with that idea. Yeah, that women ought to be silenced. Okay. A good woman is a silent woman. Women, women ought to be not seen and not heard. Mm -hmm. This is wrong, and we know this from the conduct of Fatima al Zahra. We know this from the conduct of Khadija al Kubra, and we know that from the conduct of Zainab, mm -hmm. Salamullah alayha. Right? Yes. And yes. This, if at least in the Shia tradition, there is no justification for it. Okay. For the silencing of women. Right. Again, I'm not talking about legal. This discussion is so interesting that with your indulgence, I'll continue until, means, until 10 happy. past, which is when we have uh, the Zohar Namaz time. So yes. moving on, um, uh, this is a comment only from Sister Sabika Shaban, one of our regular listeners. Dr. Muhammad Akram Nabawi's al Mudahit Muhaddetat, mm -hmm. the Women Scholars in Islam, required 40 volumes to comprehensively capture women's history in this very specific segment of Islamic scholarship. Your undertaking was in many ways more difficult, incredibly more difficult, because of the 21 people limitation. Um, so that's a comment. Um, brief, brief response from you, please. Yes, we have biographies of women, biographical uh, notices on women, yes. as early as the ninth century uh, of the Common Era, that is the third century of the Islamic uh, Hijri calendar. Yeah. Um, but again, writing about names and giving lists of names and the hadith that they have transmitted yes. is one thing. And then talking about the social significance of the role of, let's say, one hadith transmitter right. is quite another. Okay. I have included Fatima of Neshabur here uh, from, the, from yes. the 11th century, right? From, yes, you did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? And she's important because 40 later Hadith transmitters refer to her as their Hadith authority. Right. Most of them are her own descendants, right? So they could sit at her feet and listen yeah. to her and then but they became very important people in hadith mm. transmission mm -hmm. until very recently very recently muslim societies had women who would come and recite hadith in their gatherings right right but those people have become have been for the most part dismissed they are not learned they are not um which may be the case they may not have been learned but they were part of this social history. Mm -hmm. And social history does not record only the ones who are correct or high achieving or important. Yes, that's not that's something else, right? Social history has to take into account of voices that have been um, disregarded. Yes, yes. Well, you know, to that last point, um, the next question uh, provides, uh, it's an interesting segue to the next question, which reads, and it's from Fatima, Thank you, Sister Fatima. How is knowing about the significant contributions of these women relevant to modern Muslim women's lives, given that Muslim women grapple with patriarchy on mm -hmm. a daily basis? That's a great question. Now, if we uh, face patriarchy today, imagine what women faced uh, 500 years ago, mm. 600 years ago. Just take the story of Pari Khanum, the Safavid princess yeah. who was killed by her own brother, who was murdered by her own brother. Uh, that's patriarchy. They fought it, they made, they laid the, their imprint in this history. Yes. And let's hope that um, the future will be less uh, violent against yeah. women. Uh, yeah. And let us work to that effect. Yeah. Let us provide examples let us remind the people who kidnap girls because they are studying or shooting girls in their head because they are studying. Let them know that the Prophet wanted women to study. Right? Acquiring knowledge is a duty on every Muslim male and female. 
Yeah. This is hadith, if you accept it. If you don't, the practice of Nana Asma'u in Western Africa during the 1850s is an example of how women's learning mattered. The mm. example of Tahere as a learned woman of her time yeah. who, were, who was killed. Uh, I didn't include many other women who were killed because they yeah. are, but, but my, a friend of mine said, well, why are you, well, don't include more women who were killed. I said, okay. Then okay. I included Taha, uh, Zaha Hadid and, and Maria Amir right. Dhani as people who, who attained the highest position in their professions. Yes. Right? Isn't that an inspiration? Now we have a Maria Mirzahani fellowship. We have a Maria Mirzahani mathematics day. She is the only woman to have won the uh, Fields Medal, the prestigious yes. Fields Medal in, in the uh, history of that recognition, of mathematical right. excellence. Right. Right? right. That should be inspiring. That should be inspiring to all of us, men and women. Right. That within one generation, a woman who lived only 40 years. Yeah, only 40 years. Right. Um, uh, Excelled right. in her field in the degree that she did, to the degree that she did. Yeah. Yes. Okay, last few minutes. Um, very quickly, uh, in, in, in these 21 women, whose story surprised you the most and whose story was the most difficult to capture? The most difficult story to capture with this story was the story of the daughter of the prophet. That mm. was very difficult for me to, yeah. uh, to write. And I know that I haven't done it justice, and that is a big. Um, l let me leave it at that. Yes, it's uh, it's an emotional it. topic, and it uh, is an I, emotional I, topic for yeah. me. And um, but the rest, I tried to go for um, in compliance with the good advice of my mentor and older dear older friend, uh, who said, "Don't go for the low hanging fruit." Yeah. Write about people who are less known. Mm -hmm. And therefore, she, he told me once, go find a Bolshevik woman. <laughs> and I found uh, Mukhlis Abubi. Yes. Right? Yes. And fascinating right. story. Yeah. Fascinating story. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, in response to Dr. Hussein Kimji, one of our past uh, uh, attendees, or one of our past. Uh, guests here. Um, the, the session is being recorded, Dr. Dr. Kimji, so you will be able to pick it up maybe in a couple of weeks when it's edited. Um, to Ken Kotecha, is Sharia a legal system or a set of ethical principles or a collection of norms? Are all Muslims expected to adhere to it? Uh, do you want to take that one? Uh, very very, very briefly. Brief I will say it's all that and more. If you're yeah. interested, uh, there are books on the topic, there are classes to take. Yeah, um, but I, I cannot do justice to your important question. Okay, and lastly, from uh, Linda, uh, who I'm going to uh, refer to in a second, actually, because she's our next guest. How would you describe your overall purpose in writing in general? Right now, Linda, I can see your picture. I'm very happy you're right at the center. It's a difficult question. Why do I write in general, or why did I write this book in particular? I write because that's the way I, uh, you know, that's what I do. I teach and I write. Um, so that's basically um, what I do for, uh, that's my vocation to teach and to yeah. study and to share some of it. I don't write anywhere quite as um, much as I should be writing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Okay, so I first, this, this was, this was a, 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 an ex an extraordinary pleasure to to talk to you uh, a to read your book first of all which i, I completed uh, a few weeks ago and and secondly then to talk to you about it and ask you questions so thank you very very much for giving us the time uh, thank you so much thank you shabir thank you uh, and your colleagues at the library uh, and thank you each and everyone for your patience and for your attendance in this uh, zoom meeting thank you so much and all Good wishes and blessings to you all. Right. And we look forward to your next publication. Um, thank I thank my, my AV team for running the session. Um, really appreciate that. Um, I'd like to close with a quick preview of our next session. And as I mentioned earlier, um, it, it is one of the people who is actually listening in to us today, and that's Linda Ilham Barto. Um, I'll be talking to Linda uh, on October the 23rd, uh, when we will discuss her book, Memoirs of a Hillbilly Muslim. Now, there's a title that is uh, intriguing. 
uh, <laughs> and one that I look forward to uh, talking to her about. So, Linda, uh, we look forward to talking to you then and uh, about your book and to hear your story. Um, so thank you. And that's it uh, for now. I will close it on that note. I wish everyone uh, a happy and safe weekend. Um, may God be with you. Take care.